and our vigilant media man Clive returns next Saturday at the earlier time of 9.20. Dana has finally been granted permission to visit her sister in the West, but can a separation of 20 years be bridged in only 10 days? I was thinking that I wouldn't mind to meet someone here. Who? Oh, I don't know. An Englishman. <laughs> Don't be so daft. I won't be a refugee. I can go anywhere I want, do anything. I'll be free. Free? It's so calculating, so cynical, it's immoral. Flying in the Branches is tomorrow at 10.15, here on 2. The rest of this evening on two is devoted to our film club at midnight, the thriller starring Sterling Hayden, The Killing, to introduce our first film, director Terence Davis. Tonight's double bill devoted to Stanley Kubrick consists of two of his most popular films, the immensely enjoyable black comedy, Dr. Strangelove, or to give it its full title, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, and his very effective thriller, The Killing. If all the generals in last week's film, Paths of Glory, were corrupt and incompetent, in Dr. Strangelove, they are childish and psychotic as well. For in Paths of Glory, the slaughter is at least confined and contained. In Strangelove, made an incredible 25 years ago, the whole world becomes a potential abattoir, even if we laugh as we die. The First World War was the first really mechanised one, but a nuclear war would involve weapons of such destructive power that we would bring Armageddon upon ourselves. In Strangelove, a state of war is brought about by a mad American general, Jack D. Ripper, played by Sterling Hayden, who sends a flight of nuclear bombers to destroy targets deep inside the Soviet Union. He seals off his base, leaving the President of the USA, together with his general staff, with the dilemma of trying to call the bombers back. What was unthinkable now becomes a reality. This is a world of the politics of terror and counter-terror, of mutual distrust and betrayal, of deception and counter-deception. In this theatre of the war game, Kubrick creates a chilling comedy of madness and treachery. Photographed in black and white, the film is almost expressionist at times, heightening the sense of shadowy people with immense destructive powers. They live out their lives in vast war rooms where they deliberate in huge circles of light and beyond them lies the dark. They talk in terms of megadeths and surviving a nuclear war by saving the elite. They are technocrats who will not preserve life on the planet but destroy it. When technology fails or the people who operate it go mad, we are suddenly brought to the edge of the abyss. What makes Strangelove so wonderful is that all this lies beneath the surface of a very, very funny film. The performances are uniformly outstanding, in particular Peter Sellers in no less than three roles, who gives, in my opinion, the best performances of his career. In fact, he was originally going to play a fourth as well, that of Major King Kong, but this fortuitously went to Slim Pickens, who clearly relishes the part, as indeed does George C. Scott as the gum-chewing, gung-ho general Buck Turgidson, whose devotion to the military way is both childlike and catastrophic. Kubrick's choice of music is especially ironic. The opening uses a dreamy rendition of the romantic ballad Try a Little Tenderness of the planes refueling in midair, a kind of mechanical copulation in a mixture of the sentimental and the deadly. The conclusion, for which Kubrick originally shot a custard pie fight in the war room but then discarded it, is accompanied by Vera Lynn's song, We'll Meet Again, which carries a message of hope when in this case there really is none. Dr. Strangelove is a dark and mordant disquisition on the nature of human folly and how that folly endangers not only the entire species but the very planet on which we live. 